Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be going over the brief history and geography of the United States of America. Apologies for the weird angle. I wanted to make sure I got as much of it in the shot as I could. Because the United States is an extremely large country, it is the second largest country in North America and the third largest country in the world by area. And it is not just this region that you see right here. It also consists of Alaska and the Hawaiian Islands, which I hope is in the shot. There are other territories as well, such as Guam, Puerto Rico, which you can't see on here, um, American Samoa, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I'm leaving one out, the U.S. Marshall Islands. Did I see that one? I'm not sure. Anyway, there are other parts of the United States over in the Pacific Ocean, which aren't included on this map, but for the sake of being concise, we're just going to talk about the 50 states of the United States tonight, and those areas we'll talk about on a later date. So, the United States being very large. Let me just go through right to left. I'll show you the next page which has a political map and then we'll flip through this book right here and I'll show you some cool pictures after I go over the history. So geographically, let me grab pencil. Going east to west, we start off with this region. Here it says the coastal plain. This region all down here in some places can be pretty hot and humid, especially down here in Florida. Where you can see the Everglades right about here. The further north you go, the more forested and cold it gets. Um, snowy in the winter, things like that. Um, and the coastline has lots of little islands and things around it. And um, what really dominates this part of the United States are the Appalachian Mountains, one of the oldest mountain chains in the world. And on the other side of this is where we have what's typically known here in America as the Midwest. Um, it is sliced in half by the Mississippi River, which flows all down through here, out to the Gulf of Mexico down here in Louisiana. So on this side of the Mississippi, um, we have the Great Lakes. We have Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. And as you can imagine, um, lots of water and things like that, but it's generally a flat area. Same with, we're on this side of the Mississippi. Um, but as we move over here to the Great Plains region, this is definitely the flattest part of the United States, right about here. The Missouri River cuts through here coming all the way down until it meets the Mississippi over here. Um, the Great Plains is dominated by a terrain known as the prairie, which is basically just grasslands as far as the eye can see. But once you get over here, we reach the Rocky Mountains, definitely the, the biggest, most mountainous part of the contiguous United States. It slices right through here. We have in this region the Yellowstone National Park over here, the Great Salt Lake, which is the, I believe, the biggest lake besides the Great Lakes, if you don't count those five over there. And over here, with the Colorado River going through, we have probably the most remarkable geographic feature of the United States, which is the Grand Canyon, which is an absolutely huge, beautiful canyon. Very stunning. This area is known as the Great Basin. It's one last big piece of flat land before you reach the Cascade Range in the Sierra Nevadas. And then we have the west coast of the United States, which compared to this side of the mountains is a lot more green and lush, very hilly. Up here is where you get more of the cold, rainy weather, and down here is where you get more of the sunny, hot weather. Right about in the middle, and the climate is perfect for redwood trees to thrive, the tallest trees in the world. And um, 
Let's see. I'm trying not to talk about San Francisco where I live. Let's move on to Alaska. Alaska's up in the very, very far northwest, just above Canada here. Alaska's home to the highest point in the Americas and North America, which is Denali, right here. The population of Alaska mainly just lives down here, since all up here is very frozen tundra, glaciers, ice, things like that. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the Hawaiian Islands, which are out in the Pacific, and they are volcanic islands, the very tropical climate, very rainy, very warm, things like that. Um, oh, that's what I was going to say about the West Coast, is Death Valley right here. This is the lowest spot in the United States. Another very deserty, very barren region. And I'm just looking over my notes one last time. I think yeah, I got everything. Okay, let me show you some of the major cities in the United States. Again, going east to west, starting off with New York City. Definitely one of the most important cities in the world in terms of global economy, not to mention um, immigration. It's a very, very uh, racially integrated city. You can find pretty much every culture in the world here in New York City. It's also where the New York Stock Exchange is located. Down here we have Washington, D.C., which is the capital of the United States. The Midwest most important cities, by far Chicago, you can see right here on the shores of Lake Michigan. And then the second most populated city is Los Angeles down here in California, mostly famous for the film industry. And with all of that out of the way, let's get into the history. Now, if you've seen my other videos, um, I always do a brief summation of history. So if you are from the United States and didn't know anything about the other countries that I've profiled, you're really going to find out today just how brief of an history I go over because since the United States has a very long, complicated history and as someone that's lived in the United States my whole life, I've gone through too many U.S. history classes in my time where I've learned too much about American history. I think um, this is going to be a very brief history. So if there's a moment in time I skip over, an event you're looking forward to that I don't mention, I'm doing an overarching history of the United States. I'm not going to cover every little tiny detail. So with that being said, about 12,000 years ago, a man was able to cross the um, land bridge, the Bering Land Bridge, um, that would have connected Russia to Alaska thus allowing people to travel into North America for the first time. The Clovis culture was the f earliest known um, actual culture in what is now the United States. They were down here in New Mexico um, around 11,000 BCE, but um, native cultures spread out all over the United States. Um, it's not quite sure what the numbers were, but it was definitely, you know, in the good millions. There were definitely dominant cultures on the East Coast, Central, just all over the Colorados, the very famous Pueblo culture up in Colorado. Um, the Cahokia Mounds are located right about here or so, I think, um, yeah, near East St. Louis in Illinois. The largest um, city in the United States before um, the Europeans arrived. And um, yeah, anyone else would have been further down, so I'll just stop there. I could go on forever. And actually, I am doing a series right now where I'm reading about all the different um, Native Americans that lived all throughout Canada and the United States. So yeah, I'm going through that right now. So I'll leave that for that video. So, the earliest European contact everyone knows would have been the Norse, but they were more up in Canada, and it is debated if they came down. Um, some scholars believe that Leif Erikson made it to what is now Massachusetts, um, but it's not proven. It's just a belief. So, what we do know for sure was that the first American to touch 
United States soil um, would have been Juan Ponce de Leon in 1513. He arrived down here in Florida. If you want to be extremely specific, Christopher Columbus landed in Puerto Rico in 1493. Um, but in terms of the contiguous United States, it would have been down here in Florida. The first city, a permanent settlement, I should say, would have been St. Augustine, Florida. Let me just check. You can see. Excellent. <laughs> St. Augustine, Florida was established in 1565. So the Spanish were more down here in this area. The French settled more this region over here. Um, there's still a lot of French influence down here in New Orleans, this area of Louisiana. The British came to around this area and started a settlement in Virginia in 1607 called Jamestown. Some other European countries came in. The Dutch came in, for instance, over here. They founded, very famously, New Amsterdam, what is now New York. Um, the Swedish, um, you know, kind of got their foot in the door a little bit. Um, but the English dominated this region. Um, definitely after the um, Seven Years' War, which I've mentioned in a few other of my videos. It was a war between France and... England and they got back at each other by just like stealing each other's colonies constantly so in America we call it the French and Indian War because the French who were settling up here in what is now Canada had a very lucrative fur trade with the natives that lived there so when the British and French started fighting the natives mostly sided with the French so that's why we call it the French and Indian War here um, but the English did manage to snatch up some French territory during that, and they definitely came away the more dominant power here in their colonies. The British had 13 colonies all down through here, and um, they, they being the British, I should say, um, were starting to heavily tax their colonists after the war to try to make up for the cost, which the colonists weren't very favorable of. Um, the colonies down here were actually extremely prosperous for Great Britain, um, and the quality of life here, at first it was a little rocky, you know, very famously the pilgrims came to, um, Plymouth Harbor, uh, to Plymouth Rock, and, um, you know, started their own way of life as a way to freely practice their religion. Um, so many, many other religious groups came as well to seek their own freedom. Um, and the quality of life there started out very poor. Over, you know, about a hundred years or so, it greatly improved. So the population of Europeans was booming. Um, we were now in the generation of actual, um, you know, real Americans, people who were born on this soil. And they did not like the fact that Great Britain all the way across the ocean was making all of their laws and taxing them so high, so they staged a revolt which turned into a full-on war. Um, very famously during the American Revolution, um, the most important figures of the colonies here got together in Philadelphia and um, issued the Declaration of Independence which um, was officially signed on July 4th, 1776. The American Revolution ended in 1781 with an official peace treaty, which was a little rocky. There was the War of 1812, where Britain got big mad and fought back against America again. Um, but, yeah, America really got their foot in the door in terms of um, establishing their own country, and they laid let down a lot of democratic laws. And um, a lot of it really hung on the native peoples that already greatly populated this land they were living on. Um, you know, the, uh, the relations were sometimes good, but mostly bad. Not to mention the European diseases that were brought over, like smallpox and measles, really wiped out um, massive amounts of populations of the native peoples here. Um, a lot of people were forced to move so that white settlers could build land, most notably down in the south where major, major farms were built. 
And of course, to work those major, major farms, um, kidnapped Africans were brought over as slaves to work. Um, it was mostly frowned down upon in the North, especially since the United States government banned the slave trade in 1807. Um, so the slave population um, was kind of like before how I was saying with the um, British, um, the population became mostly people who were born in America and not in Africa and started their own culture. Um, but yeah, I'm getting off topic now. Um, the native peoples were one of the main issues at the time, especially after 1803 when France sold their piece of land to the United States called the Louisiana Purchase. And, um, you know, Americans started to head west to farm and cultivate that land, ran into natives, issues came up, disease spread, wars, all of those horrible things. Um, later, the United States annexed Texas in 1845 after the Mexican-American War in 1848, Mexico handed over their land over here, which mostly consisted of California, most famously. And then things really started to kick off in 1849 when gold was discovered in California. And a huge rush of people moved west to find gold, to um, seek out new life, and not just in the United States, but in other countries all around the world moved to California. So one of the issues that came up when all of this new territory was awarded to the United States was what do we do about the slave issue? Because slavery was outlawed in some states, it was legal in some other states. So um, the president at the time, Abraham Lincoln, declared that any new states that were created would not be slave states which I know, angered some people because they wanted to cultivate that land and build huge farms and have slaves work it, things like that. Um, the issue became so contentious that most of the southern states down here in the United States seceded from the United States in 1861 so that they could continue slavery um, and threatened violence if anyone tried to stop the Confederacy, as it was called. And obviously, the government was like, well, you can't do that. That's against the, the Constitution. And so war broke out. The American Civil War was the um, bloodiest war in the United States history. It killed around 618,000 soldiers. And it led to the southern states surrendering and rejoining the United States. Very famously, in 1863... President Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation that freed all slaves within the United States. So the southern states were forced to allow freedom to their slaves, which many people down here were not happy about. Obviously, the slaves were very happy about it, but the white landowners, I should say, were not happy about it and did all they could during the Reconstruction Age to try to keep um, black people from prospering and taking over the industry to the point where racist organizations were formed. Jim Crow laws eventually were created to try to segregate um, black people and white people. Um, but moving on, um, like I said, the United States was expanding. Um, Homestead Acts allowed legally for people to come and claim land. In order to do that, they would have to clear out Native Americans, which it's in this period that the Natives really, really, really tried to fight back to save their land and sadly were defeated and forced to move on to reservations so that other people could take their land and cultivate it. Um, urbanization became a huge thing in the United States. Um, immigration as well, particularly to New York, which was one of the main ports from Europe. Um, all of that labor that was willing to work whatever, because most of them were penniless, um, led to a lot of job creation, lots of textiles, industry, manufacturing. Railroads also were a huge thing. They connected the railroad together across the United States. Um, and the United States couldn't stop expanding. Um, the United States bought Alaska in 1867 from the Russians. I should have said 
um, that the Russians came here to Alaska in 1784 and founded Three Saints Bay, which is just on the tip of this island over here. Um, but yeah, they bought it off the Russians and made it American soil. Um, the Hawaiian monarchy was overthrown in 1893 in order to um, really reap the benefits of the land here. Um, what else? The Spanish-American War happens. I talk about it more in my video on the Philippines. But they wound up claiming um, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines became United States soil in 1900. We got American Samoa. And the U.S. Virgin Islands were purchased in 1917. Also in 1917, the United States joined World War I in um, a really weird tidbit where... The United States intercepted a message from the Kaiser in Germany to Mexico saying that if Mexico teamed up with them, they would give them America when they won the war. So America was very offended by that and went to war. There were other reasons, but that's my favorite one. Um, and that was really, really when the United States started to become a global superpower after they um, joined World War I right at the end of it, honestly, but it really was a catalyst to wrap it up and end that war. We have the Roaring Twenties afterward, where after the influenza pandemic, because World War I helped spread um, the flu virus around the world, um, the 1920s was a huge economic boom, followed by the Great Depression in 1929, the massive recession, um, known as the Great Depression, and the United States really struggled to get back on its feet for the next decade or so until um, World War II comes along. So the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor right here in Hawaii as a way to instigate war with the United States, and the United States definitely were answered back with a long series of naval battles in the Pacific, and I do go over this in my History of Japan video as well. That ended in 1945, when the United States um, produced atomic bombs and dropped them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, which made Japan surrender and ended World War II around the world. Right after that, since Russia, you know, was their own superpower, the United States was now their own superpower, things really came to a ahead in a way in the Cold War. So the USSR was a communist country, the USA was a capitalist country, both were accumulating atomic weapons, stockpiling them like crazy to try to one up another. And it's known as the Cold War because the US and Russia did not actually fight like a traditional war. It was mostly an anything you can do I can do better kind of thing. And also the United States really focused on stopping communist governments before they could start. Um, the Korean War happened because of the Cold War. The Vietnam War is definitely the most famous event of the Cold War, followed by the Bay of Pigs event in Cuba, where the United States um, quite possibly, we'll never know for sure, um, almost stopped the nuclear war between the countries almost stopped, did stop, hopefully. Um, but on the other end of the more peaceful spectrum of the Cold War was the space race, since the Russian space program was taking off in leaps and bounds, sending satellites and eventually men into orbit. The United States went up to them by starting their own space program, which eventually sent men to the moon in 1969. Also in the 1960s, we have the Civil Rights Movement, where the um, black Americans in the South mainly were um, fighting, fighting peacefully, I should say, peacefully protesting for their rights of equality um, to end Jim Crow laws. It spread out across the United States, um, very famous marches all throughout the United States. Um, and the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1968, which made, you know, everyone equal. I mean, that's still a thing that's ongoing, but nonetheless, it was in writing. 
um, after the Soviet Union broke apart in 1991, I believe, um, essentially the United States won the Cold War in that sense, and um, it was almost like, who are we going to go after next? Not really, but it seems that way when you look at history. But who they went after next would have been Iraq with the Gulf War. And I talk about this in my video on Kuwait. Um, Iraq invaded Kuwait. The United States decided to help them out. And the Gulf War went on from 1990 to 1991. And the United States ever since then has had a very active presence in the Middle East, especially after September 11th, 2001, when a terrorist organization attacked New York City and Washington, D.C. The United States launched a war on terror that attacked Iraq and Afghanistan, um, eventually killing the leader of that terrorist organization in Pakistan. And it's um, technically over, but there's still a lot of American presence in that area of the world. It's also aggravated the people who've lived there since very terrible things happened over there that we're not going to talk about on a relaxation channel just for the sake of relaxation and just it's an ongoing cycle over in the Middle East um, pretty much all perpetrated by the United States um, the United States elected their first African-American president in 2008 immediately after that um, America elected a fascist white supremacist in 2016, most likely elected due to Russian interference. When the next election occurred and he lost, there was um, nearly a coup in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021, which thankfully was thwarted, mostly because the crowd were a bit moronic, honestly. And... <laughs> That is where we are today in United States history. I told you it would be brief, wouldn't I? <laughs> Didn't I? So let's flip through the book. I'm going to change the angle so it's not so wide and out there. Or, you know, yeah, I'm going to change the angle so it's a little easier to see. Much better. Okay, let's flip through this book and I'll show you some cool pictures of the United States. Starting off with the cover, there's the Golden Gate Bridge. the Statue of Liberty in New York City, which is a symbol for immigrants coming to America to seek a better life and better opportunities. A nation of seekers and builders, kind of showing the diversity of the United States since there are people from all over the world. Here's a colored photograph from 1905. Immigrants coming to Ellis Island in New York City. Let's see, this is the Battle of Bennington, August 6, 1777 in Vermont, in the Revolutionary War. A picture of some of the textile industries. We have a Civil Rights Movement march. It says this is in Detroit. And American soldiers, it says they're flying home from Iraq. Here's a political map of the United States, but I'm pretty sure the one I showed you was way better. Some of the incredible scenery in the United States. These are the Rocky Mountains. There's pretty much like every environment in the United States. Here's the Great Plains and all of the bison out there. We have a geographic map of the United States, but again, I showed you a much cooler one. <laughs> This is some of the marshland in the Gulf of Mexico. The White Mountains in New Hampshire, part of the Appalachian Mountains. Apparently you can tell that the mountains are old by their shape. So the more rounded a mountain range is, the older it is because it's been weathered over time. And the more jagged and pointy it is, the newer it is. Here's a photo from... Hurricane Katrina in 2005, when a massive hurricane devastated New Orleans and other parts of the U.S., but particularly New Orleans. A gorgeous field of sunflowers, isn't that lovely? Here is, um, it's not the Grand Canyon, it says this is Canyonlands National Park in Utah. 
And up here we have the beautiful scenery of Washington and there's Mount Rainier. Hawaii, being gorgeous. And here we can see Chicago and Los Angeles. This is in Puerto Rico. This was a fort that the Spanish built, it says in 1539. Niagara Falls, I probably should have mentioned that in the geography, but it's part of the Great Lakes, huge, huge waterfalls that spans the U.S.-Canada border. The Mississippi River, very, very big, long river. Here is a tornado, very prominent in the whole Tornado Alley section of the United States. Here's a big moose. Moose are gigantic. And over here, these kids apparently found a mammoth bone. That's pretty cool. I thought it was a snake at first, which reminds me there is a picture of a rattlesnake later on. I'll warn you when it's coming up. But here we have a beautiful polar bear and some bison. Bison were incredibly important to many Native American tribes, so when white settlers were trying to drive them out of their land, they massacred them by the thousands and, you know, left their corpses out to rot, so it starved many, many Native peoples and nearly wiped out the entire population, but since then there's been a big push to repopulate the bison back into America and, um... I think they're just an endangered species, like like the lowest possible threat level, because they're really bouncing back. Here comes the snake, so if you don't like snakes, um, I'll tell you when it's gone, but here we go. I think snakes are beautiful. There's some wild horses here, and a big old diamondback rattlesnake, probably the most dangerous snake in the United States. Okay, it's gone, because I really want to show you this gorgeous blue whale, the largest animal to ever live on earth, even in dinosaur times. We have the peregrine falcon, the fastest animal on earth, and the symbol of America, the bald eagle. Um, up here, I wonder if this, yes, this is General Sherman. This is the tallest tree in the world. Does it say how big it is right here? the largest tree in the world in terms of volume of its trunk. Its base is 36.5 feet, and its biggest branch is wider than most cars. Some of the gorgeous deserty southwest terrain, and a mountain lion. This is a Florida panther, they're called, and um, a really terrible hockey team, but a very beautiful animal. I don't mean to offend any Panthers fans. You guys are cool. I'm a Sharks fan, so it's whatever. Oh, some native peoples fighting a big old woolly mammoth. That's pretty cool. And another picture of some Native Americans. Looks like they're cooking up some dinner here. Let's see. These are some of the Anasazi dwellings that were built and mysteriously abandoned. Down here in the canyons, they carved little homes into the rocks. Really, really cool. Here is a picture of St. Augustine, Florida, the first permanent settlement by Europeans in the United States. Um, this looks like... Oh yeah, this is Roanoke Colony, one of the few English colonies that failed. And um, everyone mysteriously disappeared, even though there's overwhelming evidence that they just moved into the native tribes. Mysteriously disappeared. Um, here we have a picture of one of the few times that white settlers and Native Americans actually got along. The natives helped out some of them and showed them how to farm and cultivate this land. White people responded by killing them, but we can see here <laughs> the battle on snowshoes, it says, from the French and Indian War. The Boston Massacre that started the Revolutionary War. And the Boston Tea Party. Um, 
which is like the thing here in America that like every kid is taught about the American Revolution. I don't know why there's such an emphasis on it, but it was a protest on the tea tax where apparently a bunch of racists dressed up as Native Americans and tossed the tea into the harbor. Whoever had this library book before wrote a bunch of numbers on this map, but this is a really cool map of the westward expansion. The original 13 colonies, land added after the American Revolution. Here's the Louisiana Purchase. Florida down here is what Spain gave to the United States. The land that the United States annexed from Mexico. The land that the Mexicans wound up giving to the United States. And what's up here? Oregon country. Okay. <laughs> here is another thing that we're taught about excessively as young children at school here in America is the um, adventures of Lewis and Clark who were sent out by the president to explore all the new territory that they bought. And this is Sacagawea, a native girl that helped guide them. Here we have, okay, by pencil, uh, a battle from the Civil War. Um, really interestingly is that photography really started to become a thing during this time. So we have lots of actual photographs from the Civil War. Let's see, soldiers preparing for battle against the Confederate armies. Here's Harriet Tubman, a very famous figure who helped rescue a lot of slaves and sent them to the north where they could be free. Here's a good map of um, states that outlawed slavery, states that allowed slavery, and um, just territories that weren't states at the time. Let's see, there's Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb. And this apparently is the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Lots and lots of people being very busy. Um, General Custer fighting the Sioux and Cheyenne forces at the Battle of Little Bighorn. I told you those battles became pretty big and awful. U.S. soldiers fighting in World War I. Here is Susan B. Anthony, who led the rights to women's suffrage and whose movement helped women gain the right to vote in 1920. Here is a soup line during the Great Depression. The Pearl Harbor attack in Hawaii. This is one of the Tuskegee Airmen, um, a very famous, um, I guess like troop squad of um, World War II fighters who are African American and, um, you know, had so many famous brave feats. And when they returned home, they came back to, you know, segregation and discrimination. So, um, one of the really great stories in African American history. This is actually Hiroshima in Japan, which really shows the destruction of atomic bombs. And um, this was a very small bomb. The atomic bombs that are around now, um, sitting underground, not being used, would cause like 10 times this destruction. It's a really horrible weapon. Here is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the most prominent uh, leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. The September 11th attack, which apparently YouTube doesn't like people to talk about, so... That was the terrorist attack in 2001 that sparked the war on terror. Let's see, here's some, I was going to say, here's some old white guys. This is creating the Constitution of the United States in 1787. The Bill of Rights, which are 10 amendments that were added to the Constitution as like an afterthought. Um, just to afford people more rights, like the right to free speech things like that. Here is George W. Bush signing the NAFTA agreement. Oh no. Is it not NAFTA? The Central American Free Trade Agreement. Close enough. Here's the flag of the United States. Let's read about it. 
it says the United States flag was created during the American Revolution. By most accounts, Francis Hopkinson of New Jersey receives credit for the design of the Stars and Stripes. Some people claim that Betsy Ross sewed the first flag, but many historians doubt this. The original flag had 13 alternating red and white stripes, and a blue patch with 13 white stars in the upper left corner. Over time, one star was added to the flag for each new state joining the Union. Today's flag still has 13 stripes along with 50 stars. <laughs> I forgot to say when Alaska and Hawaii joined the United States are in history, but oh well. There's Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, and a picture of the United States Congress, um, the U.S. Supreme Court, and this shows you just how old this book is with John Kerry and John Edwards, who ran for president against George W. Bush for his second term. The United States Congress building. And this would be a Korean War monument. Here's a map of Washington, D.C. that is full of all different kinds of monuments and museums, along with the Capitol building, the White House, and um, the Library of Congress the Supreme Court, all of those important things. Skyscrapers, very important thing that you see, very prominent thing I meant to say, in United States cities. Here's a picture of United States currency. We have a resources map, as you can see. Large territory means lots and lots of different types of resources. Corn is definitely one of the major, major, major crops in the United States, along with soybeans. This, my goodness, this is a coal mine in Wyoming, it says. And down here we see Henry Ford, who um, invented basically a faster way to produce cars, which made it more affordable for people. Is this an Apple store? In Palo Alto. And here are the inventors of Google. Let's see. We... <laughs> a call center. Very famous in America, I think. And the congestion in the American cities. Another great picture of just how many different types of people live in the United States. Incredibly diverse. Here's a good population map where you can see majority of people live down here and around here, around the coast, not so much in the middle. A picture of the suburbs over here. A very good example of what life is like just outside of America cities. A voting booth. A picture of a Chinatown. Like I said, um, there's lots and lots of different cultures all throughout the United States, but the Chinese came in huge numbers um, during the gold rush, and when the railroads were being built, um, yeah, the Chinese came over in massive numbers in order to, oh, I just remembered, <laughs> in order to um, seek better employment. What I forgot to talk about was the Japanese internment during World War II after the Pearl Harbor attack, but maybe it'll come up in here. Oh, I know these are Chinese Americans, but still. They're protesting for unemployment benefits. And here we see another kind of protest. In Chicago, it says. Look at this building. This is the Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California. Here we can see the Puritans coming over to practice their freedom of religion. Some really amazing Native American costumes. And this is a Hindu temple. That's all religions are allowed in the United States. Some men praying at a mosque. This is the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. There's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we have the governor of Missouri signing an order to expel the Mormons. And a typical American family. So this says some American Muslims have gone to great lengths to counteract discrimination. That is true. Here's the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. 
and what is this? The first Bible printed in North America in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1663. Some famous American writers. We have Herman Melville, Mark Twain, William Faulkner, T.S. Eliot. Um, here is the Met, the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. Definitely the most famous art museum in the United States. A Thomas Cole painting, sorry, Thomas Cole painting, and an Andy Warhol painting. Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. Frank Lloyd Wright definitely being like the most famous American architect of all time. A statue in New York City of um, General Sherman. Some famous entertainers in America. We have Elvis Presley and the great Lucille Ball. And famous athletes. Don't really know baseball. Johnny Damon of the New York Yankees. Muhammad Ali and Tiger Woods. Really beautiful homes. Another example of um, suburban life in the United States. And on the other end of the spectrum, this is a soup kitchen in New York City for the homeless. A good picture of what highways look like, especially where I live in the United States. Rules of the road. What is this? Oh, it's laws about um, teenage drivers. And here's some kids working hard in school. Food. We have New York pizza, which is probably my favorite kind of pizza. Not to um, spark contentious debates, but my least favorite is Chicago style. Um, and I am a no pineapple person. Thanksgiving is an important holiday in the United States that centers around food, but I don't see any mashed potatoes or a green bean casserole, so what's the point? Um, barbecuing is a very popular way of eating and celebrating with friends and family during holidays. Count the ball. Oh, this is in Oakland. It's at an A's game. And Double Dutch, one of the best playground games for kids. Ooh, tourists getting a guided tour of coral reefs in a glass bottom boat. That's awesome. And here's a typical picture of what Christmas looks like in a suburban home. And a Chinese New Year parade. And a 4th of July fireworks. And that's it for the book. So, that's it for my video tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I do have a lot more videos coming up about the United States. Look at my calendar. I've got some fact books. Gonna whisper some to you. Uh, I have a biography to read to you. I won't spoil who it's about, but it's a very, very um, important figure, I think, in United States history that goes really um, underrated and is just now um, becoming more of a, a beloved person across the U.S. So I'm gonna profile him instead of someone like Dr. King or let's say like Amelia Earhart, you know, the typical like United States biographies, things like that. Um, and I've got some You Choose books, which are Choose Your Own Adventure books, which are some of my favorites. With spot on my finger. Oh well. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, good, good night.